Hello, and welcome back to our journey through the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, I'm Wave Nunley, and I'm here with my wife, Lacey. And we have, in previous episodes, talked about Jesus' reformation or cleansing of the temple. Then we process through a discussion of Jesus with his disciples on the Mount of Olives about what the future would look like. And in this episode, we're going to be traveling to Bethany on the backside of the Mount of Olives with a discussion of Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead and of his anointing for burial. And if I'm correct, Bethany is near Jerusalem. It's very close. And I think you're going to show us some pictures and videos of that area, that's right. just like he's done in previous um, in previous sessions. And that's what I love about what we can do is we can not only bring the word of God, but we can bring that context. We can bring pictures, videos, wave as studied the rabbis of the time and other ancient sources, and he can bring that to light. And so I'm excited about today, about this particular session, the anointing at Bethany. Yeah, so let's pack our bags and get ready to let's go. walk with Jesus to Bethany. So as a quick review, we started out uh, in on the Temple Mount with Jesus calling for Re worship reform and uh, what we call the temple cleansing. Then he processes out the southern end and over to the Mount of Olives. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up the narrative of the last week of Jesus' life on the backside. Here's the Mount of Olives, the ridge running north and south, east of Jerusalem. We're going to pick up with his visit to the city of Bethany which is on the backside, on the wilderness side, the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. And so it is outside of Jerusalem, Bethany is. Yes. Okay. And um, it's is it is it coming up the hill from Jericho? So, yeah, you have a, a steep ascent from Jericho to Bethany of, of about 4,000 feet wow. in altitude in a very short time. So it's a difficult climb here in this, before we even start the video, uh, we can see the Mount of Olives right here. That basically is a, is a point of separation between the city of Jerusalem proper here. There's the Temple Mount with the Golden Dome and the Judean wilderness that is on the eastern side. So on the west of the Mount of Olives is the city, Kidron Valley, city of Jerusalem. And on the eastern side is the Judean wilderness. And then you can even see this blue strip here that is the Dead Sea, 17 miles uh, from Jerusalem. We start out on the west side of Jerusalem. We're looking across Jerusalem from the west. Notice we're in a perfect line here with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and East Jerusalem all inside of the, the city wall. And then straight behind the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the Dome of the Rock, which marks the Temple Mount, this rectangular surface here. Beyond the Temple Mount, and this is the southern end where uh, Jesus exited, we get the southern steps and on down into the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and then behind the Mount of Olives over to the city of Bethany. A quick map of the area has Jesus coming up from Jericho, ascending that 4,000 feet in altitude and coming to the area of modern Bethany. And Bethany is a really interesting place, especially today, because uh, Israel has built a security wall that separates Jerusalem proper from Bethany, which is West Bank. It's Palestinian Authority uh, territory. Almost no groups go there anymore because it's such a long journey to get around the wall back up to Bethany. And then you have to retrace your steps to continue your study for that day. 
So it's been years and years since I was in Bethany. So it's neat to be able to go there digitally, you know, walking with Jesus Absolutely. via computer. So uh, you see this yellow line that I have drawn here, marking what I'm thinking makes sense to be the old Roman road that then comes up from Jericho. And then there's a spur of land that connects Bethany to the next stop in Jesus itinerary, which is Bethphage or in Hebrew, Beit Page. Um, and that is on the very precipice that's on the summit of the Mount of Olives. Gen then Jesus is able to go through that little dip, that little saddle and down into Jerusalem proper. Here we have just sticking out of the uh, southern end of the Mount of Olives, you can see the Temple Mount right here, the southern wall of the of the Temple Mount. And just barely uh, visible is the golden dome that marks the Dome of the Rock and the location of the two temples. Solomon's Temple and then Ezra and Nehemiah's Temple refurbished by uh, Herod the Great. So what we're going to do is we're in this study, we will visit the location of the raising of Lazarus, Lazarus's burial site and the place where Jesus raised him from the dead. Another video to just put that in motion and bring us right down onto site. Here is the Christian church and then uh, the minaret of an Islamic mosque. And Lazarus's tomb is right there in the middle in between them. There's a very narrow alleyway that leads down to the main road where your bus can park. So you're as close to uh, the city of Bethany as we're probably going to get in the next little while. You see the security fence in the background that separates Bethany as a part of the West Bank or part of the Palestinian Authority territory from um, Jerusalem proper, Mount of Olives here. And coming up on our right is the Judean wilderness. We've been talking about that. You get a good view of it from here. And Jesus' journey down toward Jericho, which is right here. So that's a diagonal shot from the Jordan Valley in Jericho, 4,000 um, feet higher in altitude uh, to the city of Bethany for the raising of Lazarus, as well as for uh, the Jesus anointing for his burial. Jesus raises Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead right here at Bethany. Notice the, the location of this Bible passage. It's in the Gospel of John. John is the only one of the four authors of our Gospels who tells us this story. And yet it's an important one because it basically is a precursor to Jesus' own resurrection that will happen just a few days later after his death and burial uh, in Jerusalem. So John, why, does he, why is it that he inserts this story? I think it's important for John because he's writing um, at, the, at, at the end of the first century. And after the first three gospels were already in place, and as an eyewitness to this Jesus story, the entire ministry of Jesus, he feels it's important to let people know, people like us 21 centuries later, to know that Jesus was sort of driving a stake in the ground. He, he was basically giving people a heads up is that the time of resurrection is at hand. And this is almost like a, a forerunner, a precursor to Jesus own resurrection. So here's a picture of Lazarus's tomb. The entrance to it today is about 15 or 20 feet higher than where the actual tomb was in Jesus day with sandstorms and erosion and that sort of thing, the earth is built up and further and further from the point of the, uh, of the original event. And so we have to go down through a tunnel underground, 15 to 20 feet below the current surface of the earth and uh, descend a very narrow set of steps. Hold on to the hand railing when you get there, guys. And to finally the opening of Lazarus' tomb. This is not a rolling stone tomb like Jesus would be raised from the dead 
after, and then a, an angel rolls the the rock, the the uh, b- the big rolling stone back from Jesus' tomb. But this is a plug style uh, tomb, and so the descent through another set of steps, and you can get a perspective on the size of these based on the tennis shoes of these students who were with me during this visit. And you can actually still go down into Lazarus's tomb. So have you been down in Lazarus' tomb? We went down into Lazarus's tomb. I confess, I have to admit it, I did. And what was it like? It was- A little scary? It was another tomb. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there are many in the land of Israel. It's, it's a land that just beautifully weds the modern with the ancient. And it's just so neat to be able to take your cell phones and your camera equipment and be with your friends and stuff. A modern thing, but it's going on in an ancient location that has been preserved for us that can be visited by us still today. Okay. Another event that takes place at Bethany, since we've taken the time to walk all this way, a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem, says the gospel, um, to Bethany for another important event in the life of Jesus in this last week uh, of his earthly ministry. Matthew records it like this. It's in the other gospels as well. Jesus was in Bethany and he's at the home of Simon the leper. He had been invited to a banquet and there was a woman who came to him. She did not have an invitation. She wasn't on the guest list, but she comes to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume and she poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. The Greek word there is klino and it's It's such an interesting word. We get the word recliner today or to recline, the verb from this Greek verb, klino. And it's very clear that Jesus is not sitting down as we would at a feast from, I don't know, the Middle Ages all the way until today with a chair, with a back. Our feet are under the table. The table is spread out in front of us. Um, Just imagine the, uh, the rest of this story, the, the woman um, takes her, her place at his feet and she is weeping and she is wiping her uh, Jesus, cleaning Jesus' feet with her hair. Can you imagine if this event had taken place in our day? She would have had to be at Jesus' feet underneath the table. How bizarre would that get? And yet that's not the way that the seating arrangement took place in Jesus' day. Here's an artist reconstruction of what is called a triclinium. Tri, like tricycle or triangle, meaning three. One, two, three sides of this table. And then servants would access the area in the middle to fill glasses or cups and and to bring more food and take trays that were empty and that kind of thing. And Jesus and the disciples would have sat around, would have leaned around on the outside. Notice that they are reclining, the Greek verb klino, to recline. And in that way, your feet are not underneath a table. Your feet are actually sticking out in the opposite direction uh, from the table that would give easy access to this woman who comes in off of the street uninvited and who uh, begins to um, clean Jesus' feet with her, her tears and her hair, his feet would have been easily accessible. So this is a great moment for us to make a point. And that is we cannot drag these stories from the Bible over into our world immediately. We first have to put them in their original context, and then they make so much more sense when we read the details of the story and we end up getting more out of that. It's just a very simple step that we have to discipline ourselves to not superimpose our culture and our world and our language and uh, practices and that kind of thing over onto biblical narratives. So was this just the way people would eat their evening meal or was this a special event? Uh, I'm not quite sure 
about that. Yeah, it's an interesting practice that seems to have been incorporated, adopted by the Jewish community in the land of Israel in the first century from the Greek world and from more, more recently Romans who practiced this consistently. It was a way of indicating as we get in ancient uh, records, like in the Passover Haggadah, where it says, um, why is it that we recline tonight? Because we are like, we are dining like kings. We were once slaves and now God has set us free. And, uh, so at a special, uh, probably special, um, occasions like a Passover celebration, it would be more, even more important, according to the ancient documents, uh, for, uh, people to ce celebrate their status as being freed by God from slavery. It's also an interesting picture of, uh, of, of the future where Jesus says that we are going to recline at table with Abraham and all of the other patriarchs in this great end time banquet. Uh, so I guess you have some reclining to look forward to in your future. All right. Maybe is the moral of the story. Here's another um, way of depicting that event uh, with Jesus speaking to and sharing a meal with uh, a, a Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, uh, but the artist has chosen not to um, reflect the reality of the triclinium style uh, table in this picture. Still, there is the reclining that's going on with the feet jutting out um, from the, the table rather than being uh, situated um, underneath the table, making more sense out of the story. Now, how did the disciples of Jesus respond uh, to this uh, opulent gift of um, the alabaster ointment being um, poured out on uh, to Jesus? The disciples were indignant. Why this waste? They're thinking very practically, totally pragmatic. This perfume could have been sold for a high price, and then the money could have been given to the poor. It's a true statement, but Jesus has a bigger picture in mind. She has done a good deed for me. The poor you will always have with you. You don't always have me. He knows that his time is short. He's done everything that he could to communicate that reality to his students to his disciples, and yet they're still struggling with getting their head around that difficult reality, that their time with Jesus, the student-teacher relationship, is drawing to a close. You don't have me with you always, he says, because when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And Jesus has predicted this death and, and, and burial um, three times in the Gospel of Matthew. This should not come to the disciples as a surprise. And yet it was so discordant, so disconnected from their thinking about what a Messiah was going to come and be and accomplish that they just were struggling with this reality that Jesus was revealing to, to them, that he was not going to sweep in on a, uh, on a, uh, a war horse and wipe out the uh, opposing oppressors and set up a, an earthly kingdom in their lifetime where they would rule at his side, but rather he was coming in the way of a servant. He was coming in the way of suffering. He was coming in the way of deferring to the will of the Father to provide the perfect sacrifice so that they and we could be reconciled through the blood of the cross and Jesus' sacrifice bearing our sins and responsibility for um, the results on himself. He's got the big picture. They have the micro picture. So, Wave, it, it makes me think about how in my life I feel like there's every indication that God is going to get me out of a rough situation. 
help me in a rough situation through one method. I am so limited by my situation, just like they were, the oppression they felt. The they were done with Roman occupation mm -hmm. and the taxation and and the guards being everywhere they went in the temple, wherever they went, there was this Roman presence and the Messiah looked like the only hope. And the way that he was to come was kind of that one method, how he would do it. And it's got to be so difficult, even though they're with Jesus to see that there is another path, even in his last week, that he would rule as king and that he would bring the victory. It's such a different path than what they felt would happen. It's also very human. Uh, um, I mean, I so identify with them as their difficult the situation was something that they wanted immediate relief from. They wanted Absolutely. the quick fix. They wanted the drive through religion. The, uh, the, they, they wanted him to right all the wrongs immediately. Mm -hmm. I want it and I want it yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. I want it and I want it five minutes ago. But Jesus has the long haul in mind. He's got the big picture in view and he was not looking for a quick fix of a, of a, of a, of a momentary, um, uh, point in history. He was looking to correct history for all time. It was just a view that they had not yet grown into. Um, I'm glad that we have the benefit of the entire scripture and, and, and the benefit of, of that bigger picture perspective that he provided. Well, it's that trust in God, taking that deep breath and trusting him in very dire situations that he will make a way when there seems to be no way and that he will bring the victory, not just for us, but to glorify his name. Right. There's more to it than just us. Yes. That our difficult time, our challenge is not too big for God. The Roman occupation was not too big for God. Absolutely. And he had a way to bring deliverance that would be internal and not external. And that's such a beautiful lesson for us today. It really is. He had a solution for our problem. Uh, you know, we focus on Jesus and appropriately so because the Bible is about God. The, the focus of the gospels is on Jesus. But there is an, an, another kind of a, a sub focus, a lesser focus that we really should uh, give a, a moment of consideration to. And that is uh, because Jesus honored this woman who comes in um, unexpectedly, uninvited. She's out of place. And yet she performs a service uh, to him personally that his disciples didn't and that his host, Simon, the former leper, had also not performed. And so he says, Jesus says about this woman, truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in her memory. You know what? That drags you and me right into this story because now we are speaking of her and what she did and we're honoring her memory. I really appreciate that about a culture, whether back in the day, whether Roman or Greek or Jewish in the land of Israel, um, women were typically uh, um, put on the edge. Yeah. They, they were marginalized. Absolutely. They were pushed to the side. Jesus in his entire ministry, whether it is his mother or it's the woman at the well, or it's this woman who comes in and, and anoints he to, for his burial, he brings them into the center with, uh, with him. But I, I really appreciate the fact that we get to be a part of this story in honoring her memory. Um, you know, Passover is all about deliverance and with the coming of Jesus, the focus is not just on deliverance from Egypt or deliverance from slavery or even deliverance from the Romans, but it's on deliverance from our enslavement to ourselves, enslavement 
uh, to the world system, enslavement to uh, what our peers think, enslave, enslavement to uh, the oppression of the enemy of our souls. Um, but what, and what Jesus is, is doing is he is recognizing something that this woman has also recognized. He says it in Luke's version of this story. This is in all three of the first gospels, but in the gospel of Luke, he says, when you, when I came into your home, you didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't um, wash my feet. Um, but this woman has washed my feet with her tears the whole time. And he says, why is that? It's because the one who is forgiven much loves much. This woman recognizes what Jesus has done for him. And she is so appreciative that she pours out that appreciation, that thankfulness onto him in a lavish way. What the disciples thought was over the top. Jesus recognized as being thoroughly legitimate. And without her even knowing it, she was preparing him for this greatest statement of the love of God, of divine intervention, of a, a fixing the problem with broken, fallen, sinful humanity. She was anointing his body for burial. And so we, we recognize this woman's place in the narrative. We respect what she did in preparing Jesus for this next huge step forward in God's history of redeeming uh, fallen mankind back to himself. And we appreciate her part in the story. We're grateful for this moment at, Beth at Bethany, this snapshot in this incredible life, the most important life, the most beautiful life ever lived. And we take a moment to visit Bethany to remember these two events that took place there in this last week as we walk through this last week with Jesus before his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's keep in mind that Jesus is the one who brings us back to life. And let's remember that our only appropriate response to the incredible gift of God, of his son born in Bethlehem as a baby, and of his son heaven's greatest gift given in our place, taking our sin upon himself and shedding his blood to cleanse us and reconcile us back to God. Let's keep these two moments in mind and like this woman, express that, find different ways to show our appreciation as we pour that love that he's poured into us out on other people Amen. in our lives. Amen. Well said. What a great time in the Word. It's rich. It's beautiful. Thank and you. And I love it in context. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you in, uh, again in the next episode. <laughs>